Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey guys, welcome to episode 191 of The Team House, hopefully without any technical t- issues tonight. I'm Jack, here with Dave. Dee's back there producing the show, and our guest tonight is Joel Funk. Joel served as a Chinook pilot, including uh, with the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment, the Night Stalkers, where he flew um, MH-47 missions in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere. So we're really excited to have him on the show tonight. Joel, thank you for joining us, man. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's a really, really great opportunity to talk to you guys. Absolutely, dude. So start us off uh, telling us about, you know, your upbringing and sort of what your path was that took you towards the military. Yeah, so I, uh, I'm from southern or southwestern Illinois. I live just across the river from St. Louis. Um, grew up on a farm. Uh, you know, kind of a cool story in and of itself. Uh, you know, farms been in the family since the 1830s. I'm um, seventh generation. Um, and so for me growing up, you know, I really had three passions in my in my life, you know, largely influenced from my dad as well, which was obviously the agriculture, um, the military, uh, which is tied to history, um, and, and finance, which is kind of weird. But, you know, if we wind up going down that rabbit hole, uh, a lot of farmers are involved with finance because there's a history they're using futures to kind of hedge their crops. Um, but also, you know, you know, within my dad's generation, a, a way to uh, supplement income uh, and to you know, make money work for you when you don't have it in the, in the ground. And so for me, uh, and, I, and I guess really the other thing that kind of drove me to the military is I live five miles south of Scott Air Force Base, which, you know, and that's, you know, later in life, you know, all my Air Force friends thought it was kind of funny that I want to go in the Army to be a pilot, even though I'm by the Air Force. But I, you know, I always figured I'd you know, accept the challenge and make life a little bit more difficult for myself than a, you know, the, the good old Air Force. But you know, I, I say that, uh, Joe, I, mean, I got a lot of friends in the Air Force because being there, Air Force base, a lot of them go into. They're they're still in the guard, still flying. You know, I got you know KC-135 pilot friends, and uh, um, but it's a huge part of the community. Most of my, a lot of my good close friends were were military uh, kids growing up, and so. Uh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I was, so th- it was a kind of a military community in a way. Is that what you're saying? That like a lot of them were military brats. Yep, uh, exactly. So we, uh, uh, and, and in fact, I'm a school board member now. So, you know, that's a huge part of the conversation that we have because that's a, that's a unique, you know, community and, and they have their own challenges with deployments. You know, even though we may not be, you know, at, at war anymore, you know, they still do their deployments, you know, overseas. And uh, so like my graduating class, you know, about a third of us, you know, not me, but a third of the school district is military. We have a a distinct um, separate elementary school for the, uh, for the Scott Air Force Base kids. And then they integrate at the middle school and the high school level. Interesting. So when you were growing up, I mean, did you have relatives that were in the military or were you just exposed to it because of your proximity? Uh, so my, my direct lineage, uh, no, except for my grandpa on my mom's side did a few years in the Air Force. Um, he actually, uh, want to be an early computer programmer uh, in between Korea and Vietnam. He, he was out uh, in the islands, you know, off the coast of Japan, listening. He had a, a signals intelligence role. Uh, so he did a couple of years, but then with that training, he wound up working for Monsanto for like 40 years because, you know, he had this technical background from the air force um, and was an early uh, adopter and user of tech within, within that company, um, which ironically is interesting because, you know, Monsanto, and, you know, GMOs and right. uh, Roundup Ready beans. It all it all kind of connects in a weird way. And then on my my dad's side, I had a um, a Navy uh, veteran uh, and an uncle who, uh, who's now since passed, but he uh, uh, he was a chaplain's assistant. And uh, yeah, you know, I don't think I don't think he had any military in his family, but you know, um, they just happened to be. He just wanted to go in the Navy. That was you know, during the during Vietnam War and. You know, that was an option he uh, he went down you know during that time so what type of farm did you grow up on because I know there are like livestock farms yield crop farms like 
right? It's not just it's not just every farmer does everything, right? And, and in fact, uh, that's a huge distinction now within agriculture. You know, a lot of people have this vision of you know the, uh, that that picture of the um, the portrait of the the farm farmer's wife and the farmer standing next to the old you know farm building and you know they got all the you know, red barn and right. cows and pigs and, and, and their crops as well. And that's not really the case anymore. Most of uh, agriculture separated. You either went livestock or you went, you know, row crop, um, you know, from a, uh, an efficiency standpoint, that makes sense. You know, if you want to just do one or the other, and a lot of people wanted to get away from livestock because it, t- it ties into the ground. Like if you don't have, you know, the, the cash flow to have uh, farm hands, like you're there, it's a 365, you know, they, you know, year long job. You, you have to work. And in fact, we're dealing with that in April because I got 500, you know, uh, 500 birds and uh, half a dozen goats and we're going to go on vacation and we've got to kind of figure out who's going to, you know, we got family, but you know, that's, you know, you, you got to work that into your plan. It's not just, Hey, we're going to go on vacation. I got to make sure I don't have to go to work for a week. People don't put up like goat go. sitter like things on the, uh, on the old telephone pole. Yeah. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> um, so, but from, from my dad's generation, he was row crop and, you know, he, he had some pigs when he was younger, uh, but that market, the bottom of that fell out or fell out in the eighties. And uh, uh, he, he got out of it before I was born. And so he's been corn, wheat, soy, uh, and then they got rid of wheat probably about 10, 15 years ago. It's been corn and soy only. Um, but for me, I'm, uh, I've always tried to do something little, do things differently, and sometimes, you know, take on the challenge. So I'm trying to integrate livestock back into the rotation and the model as well, become a, a more diversified um, and retail farm to table type of type of model. So how did but, you uh, how did, how did you end up in the military then after uh, after high school? So I um I, I was attracted to the history of it. And I don't really remember what kind of moved me to the interest of going to special operations, but uh, the special operations role and, and was something I always strive for. You know, at one point I thought it was going to be a SEAL. Um, and uh, jokingly, my mom put me in a lifeguard uh, training to try to deter me from that. She didn't think I was, you know, I was going to like it. And, uh, I want to direct myself towards the army instead. I thought, and of course, I, I bounced around back and forth. Like I thought I might want to go the Ranger route, or I wanted to go Green Beret route. But I think the one thing that really stuck in my mind um, that I, I came back to when I thought I wanted to fly um, was in high school. I, I went to school with uh, um, I'll go ahead and say her name. I don't think she'd mind. Uh, Teresa Lucas, who was the youngest daughter of uh, Captain Keith Lucas, who was the first KIA uh, of the 160th. So he uh, um, uh, he passed away in Grenada uh, during uh, uh, Urgent Fury, and uh, you know it um, actually passed. So that that operation was October of '83. So he actually you know, he passed the, the month I was born, which of course found that out later. And it's just another irony, you know, coincidence. It just you know, it was the story just kind of stuck with you. So, but for how I came about knowing that we had. A, uh, 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 a, uh, an assignment in English class, you know, controversial issues. And so because, you know, the, for those that have read their history, they know that, you know, special operations now, even though it's still classified and still controlled on the information, it was a whole different story in the eighties. Uh-huh. And now, I mean, you can read a Sean Naylor book and know a whole lot more than a lot of guys get read in on, you know, in programs now. And, but back then it was, you know, no internet. I mean, hush, hush. So, you know, she told a story where her dad, you know, died, didn't come home. And the government told her mom that he was, uh, he'd passed away in the bombing, um, in Lebanon, which happened at the same time. Holy shit. And so for you, ye- yeah. Uh, and so for years she was trying to get, you know, the truth because back then, like the 160 was, you know, it was task force, uh, 160 was on the compound at Fort Campbell and, you know, it was, it was locked down. Like it was, you know, not a lot of people knew about it. And, uh, and so she told that story. But the one thing that stuck with me was how closely tied the unit was to her and her family, you know, from then on, you know, it's, it's not well known, 
But the the regimental commander will sign, you know, a handwritten note, a letter to all the Gold Star families on the anniversary of their uh, the families, uh, their their soldier having passed away, you know, up until now. Um, you know, they the the, the Night Stalker Association is, is very close knit. You know, it's you know when, when you're in your your family, and so that was like, wow, that's you know, that's really powerful. Like, I'm, I might want to be part, you know, be part of that someday. And so, uh, you know, the, that was kind of the goal. And then just trying to figure out how to get there, right? So uh, I applied to West Point and with the nomination process, my congressman at the time, I did get a nomination, but I was on the waiting list. And so in, in, in typical good, uh, you know, not being in the military yet, but having a second and third order, you know, effect plan, you know, having a contingency plan built into the plan, uh, I applied to the Citadel as well. And so I went there for, uh, for college uh, on the, uh, an ROTC scholarship with the intent of you know, becoming uh, an officer. And so what was the Citadel like when you, when you showed up there? Was it, was it the dream come true or uh... was it taps? <laughs> no. So it, um, it, when I was there, they, they, they definitely prided themselves in having at least regardless if it was true or not, the, the reputation of being the most difficult military school in, in the whole country. And so, you know, freshman year sucked. I mean, it, you, uh, lots of, you know, you, your head's shaved, you're, you're, you're running around all the time. You're always getting yelled at. I mean, it's, it was, uh, it was intense. Uh, but uh, I chose that route because I, I was actually offered a, a four year scholarship to go to Embry Riddle on a ROTC scholarship. But I had this, idea that if I, I didn't have the structure, I was going to flunk out the first semester. And I probably would have, because I wasn't, um, I, I, I wasn't an angel <laughs> in, in high school. And I was like, I really, I need to buckle down. I need to have this structure. I need to be, you know, have a curfew, get my grades right and, and graduate and you know, pursue uh, my dreams. And uh, I worked in Grand, I still got in trouble, but you know, if you get in trouble there, then you, you don't leave the, the campus. So it was, it was difficult, uh, but I, I really kind of you know, came into my own there, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the joke about the Citadel is you build, you know, you, it's a place you, you you hate to be, but you love to be from. Uh-huh. Uh, and and being a, being a Yankee in Charleston, South Carolina, gave me a whole other perspective as well. And, and that's something I've always uh, had baked into my life is, I, I, I want to know what I don't know. And so going to a Southern military college um, and being within that culture um, definitely widened my aperture a, a, a good bit. Um, I mean, there a lot, there's a lot to that, of course, but I remember growing up, you know, in, in, in Illinois, like we would have Lincoln impersonators come in and talk about all the great things that Abraham Lincoln did, you know, bringing the slaves and went on the war and you go to, Things might be a little different now, but Lincoln was like, you know, the devil incarnate uh, in <laughs> in Charleston, South Carolina. He was he was not looked favorably upon. <laughs> Did I mean, we we wore gray? When when you went to the Citadel, you, like you had this idea to be a pilot in the I assume in the army because you wanted to go to get to the one sixtieth eventually. Yeah. Did, did that affect? the like the courses at all did that affect is everybody just the same while they're at the citadel do they break break out the infantry guys did you get to choose what track you wanted to pick when you went into the citadel how did all that work so once again back to that bouncing back and forth thing like i actually went to the citadel with the intent of being going the medical route i wanted to be a trauma doc and you know and come to find out like you actually had drama doctors on the back of you know chinooks and you know when you're deployed and they they would you know there's special there's smooths you know built around um having these highly ex you know uh experienced doctors didn't know that of course at the time um but then i changed my my major when i got there to political science because that was you know uh politics and history was something that i was always fascinated with and i, I liked i think i'd go that route instead so at that point, I, I actually thought I was going to be go the ground route, but then, um, you know, I uh, also realized that I, I don't really like running a whole lot and rucking. Um, you know, the, the aviation route seemed a little bit more uh, appealing to me in that that sense as well. But to actually answer your question about, you know, how you're wrapped and stacked, 
at the Citadel, only about a third of the people uh, that go there go into the service. Oh, interesting. And even, yeah, mo- most of the Citadel grads go, uh, the highest population are those that are in, from South Carolina or North Carolina. And another joke with the Citadel is, you know, you have, you have a class ring um, and the ring won't get you a job, but it'll get you an interview because uh, it's highly respected within, you know, within business and within government that you can get through four years of that shit, then you, 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 you probably, you know, you can probably do the job um, and you, you can bring a certain amount of discipline and, um, and resilience and grit to, to whatever job you're going to be doing. And it's not just the army. The army has the biggest ROTC unit there. Uh, but there's a bunch that are in the air force and the Navy and the Marines, uh, as well. And so I got, I got friends that fly 53s in the Navy. Uh, I got air force officer, uh, friends. I don't think I have any pilots there. I do have a pilot friend, but I went to high school with him, which is another kind of cool thing about coming from a military community. Like I had 130 gra- or in, in high school, 130 people I graduated with. And I got friends that work for, you know, space industries, three letter agencies, um, one that's still in the army, uh, a handful that are still in the air force flying KC one to 35s, you know, a small farming community in the middle of, you know, Southwestern Illinois, but a whole lot of government military as well. Um, but the, the Citadel is uh, one of five senior military colleges. Uh, and what I didn't know about this until, uh, when you, when you're going the officer route, uh, you have officer basic between your junior and senior year, uh, for the army. I can't speak for the other branches. And there is where you put in your branch choices, whether you're going to be armor or infantry or aviation. And for a, a senior military college, those would be Norwich, uh, Citadel, A&M, uh, North Georgia, and I think I'm missing one. Uh, DMI, sorry. DMI grads, and me are going to gonna hate me for, for leaving you last because there's, there's a huge... Uh, you know, the BMI Citadel game every year. Um, everyone that's not in one of those five military colleges aren't just fighting for their branch. They're fighting to be active duty. Uh-huh. So you actually, you actually get wrapped and stacked to even get on the active duty roles. Then you get your branch assignment. Uh, the senior military colleges, you get, you go active duty automatically if you want it. Um, but most of the grads of the Citadel wound up going guard. They didn't, they didn't go active. So I got... I got friends that are South Carolina guard, Montana guard. Um, and then your senior year is when you get your branch assignment. And so you got branched into aviation. And then what is that pathway then to, to actually becoming a pilot? So you get branched aviation and then, um, and then you go to good old mother Rucker, Silk Rucker, Alabama um, to go to fight school. At the time that I was going through, you know, we're talking 2006, so we're in the middle of the surge, uh, a huge expansion in the military. Uh, I was back while I didn't start school, actually going through the flight school program for about six months. So I, can, I think I started May of 06, and I graduated October of 7. I remember, it was about 18 months for me. But um, the, the Apache pilots that I was going through, they, almost, they took close to two years the Apache uh, course is longer. Uh, so you, you go to Rucker and then you go through um, initial uh, pilot training. Uh, when I was there, it was a Bell 206, which is like a traffic copter. Now they fly like Lakotas. So you learn how to hover and fly and you learn airspace and, you know, you just learn the basics. And then you go to BNAV, which is you're actually doing more of a, uh, a tactical role. You're flying point to point. You're going NOE. Uh, NOE is nap of the earth, so low to the ground. Um, you're flying in more of a combat role, and then, uh, but still not in your advanced airframe. At that point, then you go to the aircraft selection, and then you you pick the aircraft you want. At the time that I was going through, you had all four, four and you had Kiowa, Apache, Blackhawk, and Chinook. Kiowas are gone now, um, and so then you go to your advanced airframe. You learn. Um, that airframe uh, and that mission set. So, you know, for the gun guys, they would they would do their advanced stuff and also incorporate their gunnery in it as well. And then, depending on how many tasks that you had to learn, your your course was, um, you know, 
longer or shorter. So the Apaches were the longest because they had the most advanced uh, armament system. Uh, I think the Black Ops were the shortest. Chinooks and uh, were kind of in between there um, because we had um, uh, probably not too much longer than the Black Ops, but um, a little bit more focus on doing external loads and some of those mission sets that Black Ops don't do. Um, and then uh, and you get orders to whatever, wherever you're going. Uh, for me, I was coming out uh, in 07 uh, and assignments at that point was very much aligned with what what uh, it was called a cab, it's still called a cab, a combat aviation brigade, where brigade is going overseas next. So they would kind of line you up for about a year, year and a half of stateside training before you would deploy. At least that was the goal because they were trying to man the bet, the brigades before they'd get deployed. And so uh, I went to Port Drum and uh, got there in 07 and then had about a year to train. I started out in the maintenance platoon because uh, everyone in an aviation brigade, uh, the the PLs for the most part are, are aviation officers. Um, so going to maintenance was good at first because it gave me a chance to kind of, because the whole time you're going through flight school, you're not really learning any of this army stuff, like how to do an OER or NCOER or, you know, how to, how to manage property. And then you kind of you show up and you're like, wow, there's all this all this army officer shit I didn't learn when I was learning how to fly. So it gave me a chance to figure that stuff out before, you know, I then went to the flight company a couple months before deployment and uh, we went to Iraq in you know, 08 to 09. So, so uh, I'll, let I'll me pause give, for a question. Before we move on, let me just give a quick shout out to the sponsor for this show. It's Battling Blades. Uh, this company makes all sorts of uh, wild stuff like this here ninja sword. That I, I always like to wing around the office, and you know I'm careful not to take off one of Dave's ears. Um, but they make all sorts of stuff like this. They also make these dice that Dave's holding. They, uh, yeah, they have amazing blades. Any type of blade you're looking for, historical like uh, rep uh, reproductions, uh, Gurkha blades, Viking blades, Greek blades like the Gladius, or I guess that's Roman, but they have like the Xiphus. Um, anything you're looking for. What's that, D? Spartan blades. Spartan blades. This right. is Team House. Um, yeah, they have amazing dice sets. They have chess sets. Um, you, honestly, check them out. They have some great stuff on sale right now if you look at their sale items. Um, if you're into collectibles or if you know somebody's into collectibles, not just sharp things, but cool dice sets if you're geeks, nerds, dweebs, Weebs. Tabletop. Yeah. <laughs> Weebs. Uh, tabletop role players. If you like the uh, cosplay stuff or the period dress, they have great uh, handmade, or I think they're handmade, but they have great costumes. Um, and they're free shipping for under uh, for anything over $200. And so, folks, you can check them out at battlingblades.com and use the promo code TEAMHOUSE. you get 20% off your order. So that's, that's a hell of a deal. Battlingblades.com, the promo code TEAMHOUSE. To get check them out. They off. have really cool stuff. And then the other thing I just want to um, shout out real quick is I want to let you guys know um, – you, we'd really appreciate it if you enjoy these interviews. If you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, it's free to do. Just hit subscribe, and you'd hit the bell icon and uh, select all notifications. So you'll get notified when we go live, uh, usually on Fridays. Uh, also, down in, uh, link down in the description is a uh, link to our Patreon, where you can get access to um, these episodes ad-free. Um, yeah, and let me tell you, Lafroy is not you. free, <laughs> um, and... And I mean, anybody who subscribes, likes, and subscribes to our Patreon, um, you know, you keep us in the booze, and we appreciate that. So, Joel, your your first deployment was to Iraq with an aviation brigade we assigned to 10th Mountain Division, I assume? Yep. Yeah, we were a uh, 10th Cab, so 10th Combat Aviation Brigade. We fell under 25th ID. Okay. That was our, our headquarters element. 25th okay. ID. Uh, out of curiosity, real quick, did, did you pick the Chinook? Was it picked for you? How, how did that process work for you? No, so I, I, I picked it um, I, uh, on, on purpose uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, A, I wanted to go to the 160th, and I think the number is about a third. I'd have to go back and double check, but about a third of all Chinooks 
in the whole army or in the 160th because they're, they're heavy on 47s as opposed to, you know, in a whole aviation brigade, you have four battalions. You have, at the time, it was basically Apaches, Kiowas, uh, Hawks, and then you had this this weird thing called a GSAB. And I, am I coming in okay? Yeah, so I'm yeah, sitting, yeah. feeling kind of echoey. Okay. In the GSAB, you had a company of Hawks that were A2C2, uh, aviation control, uh, command and control. So they would they have special consoles in the back. So brigade commander and division commander can fly up, up, up above the mission and do uh, uh, AB, like air assault uh, command and control. So you have a company of Hawks doing that. You have the company of Chinooks, and then you have the company of Medivac. So the GSABs is a weird amalgamation of the shit they shoved into a battalion that didn't fit anywhere else. And so, you know, it, so in the whole brigade, you have each one of these battalions, you got three companies of, uh, of flight. So you got basically one, two, five companies of Hawks, you know, in, in a brigade and one company of Chinooks. I mean, the, just the ratio is different. Um, so I went into the 160th, and I figured, you know, if, if I flew Chinooks, if I had that mission set already on any of my, you know, any of my belt, that would be, make me more competitive. Um, and also, from a survivability, longevity standpoint, and from just my own personality, uh, the Chinook appealed to me. You know, most aviation accidents happen because of pilot error. It's not the, it's not the, it's not the aircraft. It's both guys are inside looking at something. They're either hitting the ground or they're hitting something and they're not supposed to, and they wind up crashing the aircraft. Um, a Chinook is like a family. You got both pilots at front, and you got two or four more sets of eyes in the back. They're just as worried about you landing on the ground the way that you know you come back from uh, worried as much as you are up front. And so, you know, it was a family. It was a community. It was a you know that that communication and that that aspect appealed to me. So that's that's why I picked the Chinook. Yeah. And so what was that first deployment like to uh, to Iraq? So it was 08 to 09. Uh, it was the, t- the tail end of the surge. So, you know, we were definitely more in, we we're still doing coin, but much more stability, trying to kind of dial back our, our footprint and let the Iraqis kind of take back over. So uh, I did one air assault the whole year I was there. And as a, you know, as junior officer, I, I, I was basically getting trained to be the air mission commander. So I was in the jump seat and, you know, back to the whole, you know, military college thing. It was cool when, you know, we, we did a face to face with the ground force infantry. I think I can't remember if it was battalion or company, but a guy that I was in a political science class in college was one of the PLs. And he just thought it was so cool that, you know, Joel was sitting up front, you know, flying the helicopter, even though it wasn't right. So, you know, he was, he was he was really happy about telling his Joe's you know about that, and uh, but that was down. That mission was east northeast of Baghdad, but the rest of the year was really just doing uh, air movement, so moving people and stuff from base to base because you know we we'd figured out that you know the biggest threat to U.S. forces in Iraq was was the bomb being on the roads, and so we were moving as much as we could through the air. Um, and because the Chinook, and I can't remember what year it happened, Chinook's a big target. And uh, the man pad threat was huge. So, you know, it, we flew, we lived at night, we were vampires. And so I was, which was great because all my mission hours are all night. Mm. And so that, that, that helped me um, understand and be once again more competitive to, to, to assess and you know, try it for the 160th because I had this night vision goggle hours and it was you know, at that point kind of second nature. I spent a year doing it. And what? so I apply, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was just going to ask, please finish that. And then I'll ask you my question. So I, um, I applied before I deployed, uh, it, with the, the full well knowledge that, you know, I, I didn't come out of flight school with, uh, you know, as the grad or any soft background. Um, and so I figured they'd say, uh, at least I was hoping for it. The best, I didn't think they would pick me up right from the get go because I had no combat experience, especially in this, you know, dynamic and environment where combat was, you know, everyone was getting deployed. And so they came back with me and said, hey, thanks for applying, get deployed, assess when you come back. So I, I had the assessment scheduled to happen uh, when I got back from Iraq. And so for me, that was like, you know, I probably could have done a lot more uh, preparation 
physically. That was the only thing I was worried about was the physical side of it. You know, doing the you know doing the PT test and doing all that aspect. And, you know, hoping I was going to be you know the PT stud. And uh, um, so I had about a month and a half, two months back home. So I, I worked my ass off in the gym <laughs> to get ready for assessment. Um, and I assessed and uh, and that. I did good enough, right? They they took me on board. I was I was I was thrilled. I love that. I did good enough because it's it's not an easy assessment. What what do you think like the attrition rate is for the for the whole assessment process? Uh, I don't know, man. Um, I mean, I mean, really, you if if they've picked you up for an assessment, you know, what I've been told is they already have a slot. That they're looking at you for so if you're going to campbell uh under with an assessment it's it's yours to lose because they want you they have a slot ready for you they don't need to fill that slot uh, but they they want to see you um you know give it all you can and, and and the most important thing is you don't quit yeah you know you can fuck up you can fuck up left and right but uh you just can't quit you can't keep trying and so, I mean, there were guys that, um, you know, because I, 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 once I assessed and I, I, I went through the training and, and I was in the unit, I wound up going back out in the conventional force to, to be a company commander in the 101st for a year. And there were guys that I thought were studs. And I was like, you, you got it. You know, I didn't tell them how to beat the assessment, but I, I gave them enough to be like, you know, to the have kind of, an, to give them a little bit of understanding of kind of, you know, these are the things they're looking for. And they came back and they didn't get picked up. And um, and I don't know if it happened, you know, if it was physically or if it was in the cockpit because there's a cockpit, you know, assessment as well. But they they put you before a board. And you know, I the one thing I had I, one of my um, one of my mentors uh, when I was in tenth uh, cab when I was deployed in Iraq was a former night stalker. And um, he put it well. And he and this is probably the best prep I had going into that was. When you come out of the board, you should feel about this big because they're going to tear you apart. Like if you don't feel like you were absolutely worthless piece of shit walking out of that room, they didn't pick you up. Like they're they're going to rip you down until they see you, they see you break, then they're done. And so for the people who didn't feel like an inch tall walking out, was it because the board just didn't see it in them and so they didn't tear them down? Or because they just had oversized egos and thought that they were like acing it when that's not the purpose of the board. Uh, a good question. I mean, I was never on a on an assessment board. Um, he was because he he used he was the uh, the regimental S one, so he sat a lot of boards, so he had a lot of experience in, in there. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe they just didn't answer a question right. I mean, that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can speculate. Yeah. I mean, the one, the one guy that I, uh, you know, I, I was a, a leader for that went, he, he thought he knew what questions we answered wrong that they didn't like, but you just don't know because, you know, you walk out of the room, they talk and they, they vote and, you know. So w without giving <laughs> any, without giving anything about the board away, because we know that the, like boards are an important part of the selection process for everything. Are are the questions personal? Are the questions technical? Do they run the gamut? Like, how do all they... the above? Okay. Um, yeah. So they they definitely they hit the personal, you know, because they have they have your application in front of you as well, and so you know they'll, and the application is is long, and and you also go through a psych eval before you go as part of the assessment, and so. They're looking for transparency, um, and and also, you know, it's a kind of trip you up a little bit. You know, I, I remember a question that they had where it was you'd rank a bunch of stuff, um, you know, a bunch of different qualities of leadership, and I think I had integrity not too far from the top, and uh, you know, and it was, it's a hard list. I mean, it's like twenty words that are you know there's some army values in there. And so they're like, so why didn't you put this at the top? And I was like, Shit, I don't know. Like, um, th they listed a couple that I did list at the top five. And I, I tried to rationalize it. And I remember, um, 
I can't remember who was on the board and uh, I'm friends with them still. And, you know, a- after the fact years later, uh, and he, he even told me, he's like, just, just stop while you're ahead. Like, yeah, that was, that was good enough. <laughs> like, I started talking myself into a circle. Yeah. Can so, you uh, talk about the relationship between first off the difference between officers and warrant officers in the, in the helicopter community and then the relationship between them. And maybe if, even if it's different between the conventional forces and the one sixtieth, cause I don't know. Um, I, I mean, definitely some similarities, um, some differences too, but I, I, I've often said that I was raised by warrants. Uh, I, I had some very strong warrant officers in my life. Uh, and, and I also had a, an under officer that's a peer of mine who's still in. He's doing great. He just got promoted to uh, lieutenant colonel, and he gave me that that lesson. He's like, you, you want you want to be raised by the warrants. Like they they they're gonna help you. They're gonna tell you. Um, they're gonna help you in the cockpit and also how to lead because they they got that experience as well. Um, I think I was. I don't know how odd this is or not, but we had two ranger. Uh, regiment guys, or they're they're a ranger regiment enlisted before they weren't the war officers uh, in my company. They were very strong personalities. I'm sure you can imagine, uh, and and great leaders and mentors, and both in the cockpit and and also from a personal standpoint. Um, and so that you know that relationships you know, different, I, I would say probably the closest you'd see that anywhere else is within, you know, within the Green Berets and the ODA teams, you know, the warrants are strong. They're there longer than the officers. The officer's role is much more managerial. You know, you, you're going to get, you know, you get promoted out of the cockpit where the warrant officers are there. Uh, I mean, that's your job. And that that's true. I would say the only difference between conventional army and regular army is it's even more true within the regiment because uh, those, those warrant officers, you know, they, you know, they're the backbone. They, they definitely stay within those companies, you know, for, for decades. Um, you know, I had a, I had a battalion commander that one of his challenges, cause he came from a little bird community and he was a commander there. And he's like, when you walk in, you realize that, you know, three quarters, I don't know, it was half or three quarters of your, your, uh, your pilot population could retire tomorrow. But that, that brings a whole other challenge. It's a whole, there's a whole level of experience there that you can tap into and that, you know, is um, of so much value. Uh, but it brings to your other challenges of, you know, of that pecking order. And also from a retention standpoint, because, you know, we don't, we don't get, we're not spring chickens anymore as we get older. Right. Right. How, how do you as an officer who outranks these people, even if they have more experience in the cockpit or on operations, how do you manage that? You there's lines and you know so within the cockpit you you have a pilot in command you know so the pilot in command is the guy that's in charge I mean he's you know he's the one that's gonna you know for lack of better words the the ones at the wheel he's gonna get the ticket uh, or uh, you know if something goes wrong um, and so there's a respect there and there's different roles within the mission as well as as an officer. Um, yeah, in fact, this is a little bit different within the conventional versus uh, the special operator within the 160th. Um, within conventional, a lot of times the AMCs were warrant officers. Um, I don't think there was ever a mission that an O officer was on within the regiment where the where the O was not the AMC. And so a lot of times, especially if you're a junior officer, uh, you're sitting in a jump seat, at least within the Chinook community. So you're in the jump seat doing the radio calls, doing the aircraft deconfliction. Um, you know, doing that role within the command and control element while the warrants are, are leading. And then the flight lead is always going to be a warrant officer because, you know, if they're either uh, the most experienced warrant officer in the flight or they are a experienced warrant officer in training to be uh, a flight lead. And when you say AMC, are you, is that assistant, uh, like, Assistant Mission Commander? Is uh, Air Mission. Air Mission Commander. So Air Mission Commander. So it's always going to be the officer in the 160th? 
Yeah, I couldn't tell you if there was an if there was an officer, if there was an O in the flight, um, the AMC was going to be okay. uh, an O. If okay. there was no O, then it'd be the you know probably the most senior warrant. Uh, but then, but then the conventional is a different story in, in large part because in a flight company you, you're going to have three uh, three lieutenants and one captain, and those lieutenants are, are junior and they're young and you know they're definitely have less experience. Uh, to command because that, your job as an air mission commander is to command the flight. You know, you're overall in charge of where that flight's going um, and to uh, uh, complete the mission and, and to run through that contingency plan too. So, you know, if you have an issue with an aircraft mal- uh, malfunction or a weather event, you're the one that's kind of in charge of figuring out the big picture of, you know, that of, do we need, how are we going to get maintenance here? Uh, or do we need security? You know, if you're in a deployed situation or if you're in the States, so like, all right, where's everyone sleeping? You know, are we, are we doing you know, sensitive items, uh, inventories and checks and where are we going to put the weapons? And, you know, you're, you're much more of that managerial admin role. Um, so Joel, once you got picked up for one sixtieth, what was the, uh, the training process? I know there's like additional training you have to go through to become, you know, a one sixtieth MH 47 pilot. Right on. And, uh, and not only that, you also have to figure out where you're at within the pipeline of mm-hmm. training uh, and school within the conventional army. So here I am. Uh, I got promoted to uh, did I get promoted to captain. Uh, when did I get promoted to captain? I, I guess so. it was when I was in Iraq. Yeah, well, I made it to major so I got out. Uh, so captain, I got picked up in Iraq. And then and so uh so picked up for captain and then you get the captain career course and I get picked up for, uh, the one sixtieth. So they, they're like, Hey, you got to do green platoon, but we're going to knock out captain career course first. So I'm at Fort drum. I, I basically swing through Fort Rucker for six months to do the captain career course and route to on orders to go to Fort Campbell. So Fort Campbell, the green platoon, six months. Uh, you got, you got ground school, you have what's called BNAV, uh, and then, um, I call I, I I said BNAB earlier when I was talking about uh, flight school, but it's, it's basic uh, basic warfighter skills, different thing. But you know, acronyms all kind of merge together in your head over, over the years. Yeah. So ground ground school is all just that. You're you're going through uh, medical. Uh, you, you're doing you're you're flipping out the map and you're you're doing your land nav. You're doing some ruck marching. You're shooting. Um, really, one thing that the two things that were probably the most fun in my whole career was doing doing a lot of uh, shoot house stuff um and going on the range both in sear school because you go through sear c at fort rucker doing through flight school and you do a couple of days of shooting um during uh basic or uh, uh, ground school um i think they call it combat schools in green platoon and so you you do all the ground stuff all the you know who army stuff then you go to bnav which is you and a little bird you know watch and a and a compass basically going from point to point trying to hit your targets plus or minus thirty seconds off on you know an old school map that you and your the rest of your plan your flight um, your planning cell is put together and so you're you're going through the old school methodology um, of uh, time distance heading to get to the target and then you go to your advanced aircraft where you if you're not already a Chinook guy um, or, or trained in that Chinook so for me like. I, I flew the old D models when I was in Iraq. And so we're talking steam gauges, you know, like there, there was no digital stuff, no moving maps. We had a moving map that they actually they had a mod the aircraft for when we were in Iraq. It was an e-board that it was like a little, you know, clunky iPad or like iPad that was on your knee that actually had a moving map on it. It was the only moving map we had. Um, so we, uh, you know, we went through a lot of paper and ink in Iraq because it was, you know, map printing every night for, uh, for every mission. Um, so older, older Chinook and then more digitally connected MH-47 golf. So I was trained on the golf. So we went through flights or a uh, green platoon in the 160th. And, um, at the same time, the rest of the army was doing the conversions from the D model to the F model. And so at that point, you know, you fast forward a couple of years and I went back to the regular army, uh, I had the golf model transition, so I understand more the advanced uh, avionics architecture uh, that the system had. But there were there were still differences in you know how some of the things were within the checklist and just the aircraft uh, system 
uh, methodology was. Um, and then, you know, the other differences between the golf versus the regular army has the Fox is the fuel probe and the hoist and the fatter tanks. And so there are other systems attached to the Chinook within the 160 that make it an image, a modified helicopter, or sorry, a multi-purpose <laughs> helicopter um, that's heavily modified. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so how, how do you, what, what's the rest of the 160th pipeline that takes you until you're, you know, a, a, I guess, certified pilot in the unit? Yeah, so Green Platoon's about six months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you graduate from Green Platoon, then you were, um, you're not, uh, I'm trying to remember how they worded it. I think you were, I think you come out of it as a BMQ. You still have to go through what's called progression when you get to the unit. So even though you basically you have the certification, you go through Green Platoon and you have the qualification of that aircraft once you get to the company. And at that point, it should just be basically a, you know, a check mark on your records because if, if you got through the pipeline, you, you you have the ability and this and the, the experience to pass the check ride when you get to the company, but you still have to go basically prove that you know what you've been what you said you knew, and then you are then ready to deploy. The the one sixtieth. So, so within. Oh please yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No no I was just gonna say the one sixtieth conducts I think sometimes miracles right the pilots do stuff that people are just amazed that they can do were there times during the pipeline you know during your green team when they were telling you what they want what they wanted you to do and you're like oh shit uh or do they work it up in a way that that makes it all attainable yeah it, it, it is because uh, there is a simulator uh at, you know that they build into the training as well so before you're actually behind an MC-130 trying to put the fuel probe into the back of the, the basket and trying to get, you know, basically do formation flight, you know, you know, behind a giant fixed wing aircraft, like you've done it, you know, in a simulator. And so they, they, they go, they definitely prepare you for that. I mean, for good reason, right? I mean, it, it's a dangerous thing and you, you want to basically kind of build up your, not just your experience, but your, your resilience and kind of your, familiarization for you really doing in real life because not only is it dangerous you know you get money involved as well in training time and hours and um so yeah i mean it's they, they build you up to it you know the overwater stuff i say the, the helicopter air to air very fuel is probably the most dicey but you know that and dust landings i mean i i only know i got one friend <laughs> um and uh that had an accident uh, behind an MC-130, you know, he lost blade, and uh, he had a, a really nasty crash landing, um, you know, in training. Uh, we, we actually flew together. We were platoon leaders together down in Savannah, uh, and uh, he, he, he doesn't remember. He doesn't <laughs> he doesn't have fond memories of that flight. But most of the accidents and the you know the the, the ass puckering moments usually have to do with dust landings, and, and really a lot of the fatalities. In, yeah. Uh, in especially the Chinook community, because that's, um, you know, you're, you're doing that a lot. I mean, because you, uh, that's your mission, especially in Afghanistan, they, the, the ground is pottery, and you're, you're, every landing is going to be a dust landing. And you, that was probably the thing we practiced the most and did the most because we, you know, I had a, a good friend who also, also happens to gotten, he's gotten into agriculture and farming since he's got out. Um, you know, it's, it's, has been part of his transition and his, um, his means to, you know, live and enjoy life. Uh, that he joked, he gave me my flight, my check ride uh, at the end of Green Platoon, and he said he's he lost more landing gear than a semi truck <laughs> than a semi trailer in Afghanistan. <laughs> and I believe it. There's there a, there a lot of snap landing gears left in the left in Afghanistan. And that, and that, but that also fueled the pipeline and the technology that came out to make those dust landings easier. Uh, and they're still working on tech now, you know, using uh, virtual reality and trying to find ways that you can see the ground without really seeing the ground with your eyeballs. Mm -hmm. you know, just... Joel, for, for people who might not 100% understand these concepts, can you tell us what a refueling with a C-130 feels like? And you can you tell us more about 
why a dust landing is so challenging for a pilot. So I'll, I'll touch on the dust landing first. So if you've ever driven through the fog at night where you can't see shit, and then imagine you're not on the ground, and then you, you know, instead of a steering wheel, you have a, you know, basically a, a joystick in your hand, and you push it a little bit too far to the left or the right, uh, and you, you try to slow down. But are you slowing down or are you going backwards? Now? And are you, are, you, are you drifting to the left or are you starting to flip upside down? I mean, that's, that's what you're dealing with in a dust landing. Like you, you can't, um, you can't see. And so you go in with enough inertia that you're, you know, it's, you know, the thing you're constantly saying over your, into your head is forward and down, forward and down. And so, you know, it, it's a lot, especially with the aircraft landing gear within the Chinook, it's not very tolerant left to right. But it'll you can smack it into the ground, and you you got a little bit of re resilience and some resistance there, and you you can come back out of it. Um, you start doing you know side to side action, you're in trouble. And so, um, I guess that's the best way of explaining it is you're in fog, but you don't necessarily know what side's up because your tires aren't on the ground anymore. Yeah, I, I mean I remember climbing onto the back ramp of, a, of MH 47 in, in, in one of those kinds of dust landings. And it's like something to describe as like, you know, like you're in uh in one of those movies where there's like the depiction of hell and there's just like red dust, like swirling all around you and you can't see a damn thing. And, and even on the ground, you know, as a, as a, as an infantry guy, you're like, where is this helicopter at? And, and when you see the crew chief, you're like, Oh, okay. Thank God. Um, yeah, it sucks, and I can I can only imagine for the for the um, pilots, it's like must be like landing underwater. I mean, you don't you don't know where the hell what's up, what's down, except for your instruments, of course. Yeah, and, and you have to coordinate the coordinate that with the ground force as well, because you don't want to. Uh, the last thing you want to do is have the LZ set up so you're overflying your people, mm, right? A because you're not you're trying not to dust them out, but you also don't want to land them. Right, uh, and so you you try to offset enough, but also not go so far that the guys have to go a quarter mile to get to the back of your ramp. So, yeah. you know, you, you got to try to stick it where you want to stick it, and you know, and hopefully no one's underneath you. Yeah, I know. By the way, w when the when the blades are turning, um, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, you get a light effect as well it's with the, the sand hitting the blades. Static, yeah, effect. yeah, the electrostatic, yeah, and and it's like. For people who haven't been to Afghanistan, like there's this dust, it's like moon dust. It's like a, it's like talcum powder. And so when you guys are coming down in your helicopters, and once that starts kicking up, you're just in this fog, like you say, that you can't see anything. And and then the yeah. video refueling. So in in that. Um, and so the you know you have link of procedures because you're trying to line up with the aircraft you know at the right altitude and the right the right heading, and so but even there like once you line up you know there's a there's a a, a function or a, a system where you basically you get to a certain uh, point on the aircraft in formation, and then the droge comes out and then you you know you you come it behind it and you line up and you're you're kind of like it's like jousting because you, know, you get the fuel probe. Uh, and the cool thing with the Chinook is the, the probe is actually, um, it doesn't extend uh, like, the, like the Hawks does. So, um, anyway, so you line up on the probe and then you, you know, you're, you're actually, the, the droge is actually coming up underneath the rotor blades. So you, you have, I mean, you got to hit it right. Like you, <laughs> you tilt your aircraft forward, you come in, you hit the probe and then you can't just stay there. Like you have to come up into the refuel position. So you hit it, you connect, and then you're physically dragging it up in the space um, with enough slack that it doesn't fall. You, the probe doesn't fall off because then you got to re completely reset. But then you can't come too forward because then you're going to crash into the dam. You're going to hit the the wing of the airplane. So there's this nice little, um, I guess, you know, That'd be better because you can't do that. In three the, feet, the, three yeah. feet margin. So, so this plane, yeah. this airplane is traveling. Uh, you know, out what, whatever they're, I don't know, hundred thirty knots, whatever they're trying. I don't know how fast the refueling happens, but this airplane is going. This helicopter catches up, hits this probe, rotates up. Yeah, it, and then you're <laughs> you're hanging you're hanging out there until you get enough gas and. 
the other consideration too is, you know, when, when you're dealing with aircraft, uh, not only are you talking about speed and, and, you know, you're also dealing with the amount of power you have. So as you're taking on gas, you're taking on weight. And so you have only so much power that you can pull. And also the aircraft has its own, the, you know, the MC-130 has its own limitations with airspeed. So it can't slow down too much because then it'll fall out of, the, out of the sky. The reason we can get behind an MC-130 is their stall speed is lower as opposed mm. to the, you know, the big boys ACs up, yeah. up at altitude. And so they can't slow down. Uh, and you can only go so fast because as you're getting, as you're bringing on more fuel and more weight, then at a certain point you can't pull any more power. So depending on the mission and the altitude and, and, the, and the temperature, you know, a lot of times, I mean, not a lot of times, but in Afghanistan, you might just fall off the probe because you can't keep up anymore. Right. And then well, you got what you got and get behind, get in the back of the line. And then because the army feels this isn't challenging enough, you also have to do it at night under nods. You know, you add that extra. Yeah, extra, extra little. You get that little extra high off of that, off that experience. Doing it all in a green world. <laughs> yep. uh, so let's talk about life in one sixtieth, man. What was uh, what was what was like the first deployment that you you hopped on uh, with the unit? So my, my first one. Uh, one thing that was so all my flying rotations, and because I came, I was in, and I came out, and I went back in. Uh, my all my flying rotations were in one year, uh, and so my first rotation was I was a uh, uh, battle captain. So I was in a staff position. Uh, you know, my job was mission tracking, but also coordination. So I was I was liaisoning with the, with the ground force and what missions they wanted to do. So you know, it was in I was in Kandahar, and we were in support at, at that point. You know. Um, my my element was in charge of in large part what you know many would call the vanilla soft so the the, the, the seals uh um outside of six uh the green berets and marsoc and so we had the the siege of soda commission the uh, combined joint special operations task force and so each component had a different region and so my job was basically say hey all right, so to West, what missions do you want to do this week? So to North, so to South, and then trying to deconflict that so that we can support as many as we could in alignment with our own limitations of crew rest and really how many crews we had. Because there was more missions that were potential than we could actually fulfill with our um, with the, the the capabilities that we had. Because at that point, it was 2012, and we were very much in the village stability operation uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, role. So we were still doing. Uh, most the rest of the regiment was supporting the TST counterterrorism, you know, go finding, you know, the local Taliban or, or bomb builder mission. Our our job was supporting that. You know, we would drop off a team one night. They would walk into town. Um, they, you know, presence patrol, shake hands, figure out where the you know, get an idea. You know, putting boots on the ground, you know, showing that they were there. And of course, throughout this whole time, the vast majority of people who were flying were Afghans. So we, we would have SEAL teams in the back, but most of it was uh, 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 was Afghan commandos. Um, so we would drop them off one night. Uh, they'd walk through during the day, and we'd pick them on the other night. Uh, the one, the biggest challenge we had was a lot of times we were doing two missions a night. And so we would you know pick up a team out in the helmet, drop them off, and then fly back to either Kandahar or uh, – I'm trying to remember where they other – actually, I think both – I think West was in the helmet out in Bastion, and then uh, I think South and Southwest were both in Kandahar, and then we had a team up in a, uh, TK Taren I don't know if either one of you guys is familiar with that, but it was kind of a, a, a this city in the middle of the mountains, uh, in like a bowl. That was fun to try to get into. So we were flying, you know, two two missions a night. A lot. Well, I wasn't. I was one coordinating it and getting yelled at because <laughs> trying to deconflict this and of course the weather would come in or the aircraft would break and then you know you 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 your 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 margin for trying to make the mission happen uh, is more difficult when you're trying to do two missions in one night when when shit starts going sideways. Um, so that was my first one. And then that was uh, and then a couple months later I went back from my flying rotation and I did two months uh, flying uh, similar missions. Um, uh, as well, it, was this when uh, you uh, flew some sort of escort for the president? Yeah. So my 
Um, yeah, so that was late spring, early summer, 12. That was when Obama came. I think it was the only time he went to Afghanistan. He met with Karzai um, in Kandahar. And so they took elements throughout the country. And that was really cool. I mean, granted, as a junior, you know, 168th officer, I, I was basically kind of just, you know, like a wallflower. Like all the all the mission planning was happening with the senior guys, all the warrant officers, um, and and one or two senior officers. And we're talking, you know, company commanders. Company commanders are within the regiment, same like, uh, um, same as the uh, SF community. They're majors, so platoon leaders and team leaders, team leaders and SF and platoon leaders and uh, the one sixtieth are captains. And so, uh, but it, it gave me a chance to see the other guys within the regiment and make some friends and share stories and, and talk that stuff while the mission planning was going on. But then also, you know, being there and seeing how many assets and how much planning went into really a couple hours mission, right? You know, how many contingencies. Um, I didn't fly the, the commander or the uh, commander in chief. I didn't fly Obama, but I saw him on the, on the tarmac. Um, and then, uh, but I got to fly behind the, we, you know, we had army one that night. It was, it was really cool. And he, <laughs> he came over the, uh, he came over the SATCOM too and, and thanked us all. It was, that was a moment to, um, that was fun. That was one of those historical moments to be involved with and, yeah. uh, and be in. That was great. Yeah. Not, not many people can, can claim to have been in the same room with an American president. Yeah. Now, a, a lot of 160 guys were after the Bin Laden raid happened. Uh, <laughs> I, I heard because, and, and that, that's that's the coolest award. One, uh, yeah, probably the, the the most prestigious award that I, I I was able, you know, I got, and I, I'm able to you know to have in my uniform that I didn't do anything to deserve because I had just finished Green Platoon when that mission happened. Like I was I was sitting in Savannah waiting to sign into the unit and then that raid happened and uh you know the, every component that was involved with the mission got a got a presidential unit citation and um you know and then finding out later and being able to fly with the guys that were on that you know that's uh, and that's you know that's probably the coolest thing about being in that unit um looking back and being part of that too is you know durant wrote the book you know in the company of heroes that's that's the god awful fucking truth is yeah the, the, the history, I mean, being taught by guys that, that wrote the book and, been, and would, had been there and done that, were on Roberts Ridge, you know, flew the, the, the Russian helicopter out of Africa uh, in the 80s. If you never read about that, that's a cool one. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot, of, a lot of history, a lot of legacy and, and heritage and just pure awesomeness um, in that unit. A lot of secret squirrels, too. Fun stuff. So and, and, uh, and, and and a lot of guys that have done a lot of great things, you know, since then too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I. Uh, it, you know, the quick aside, um, you know, Durant ran for Senate this last year, mm. and never met the guy, but you know, I connected back on LinkedIn a while back, and I sent him a message because uh, I um, I got some uh, some campaign campaign history in my background too, and I thanked him for running, uh, and I was I was saddened to see him lose because he that's the type of guy we need, you know, you know, leading this country, both not just, you know, those, those individuals that put themselves out and, and serve their country within the military, but then also step back and say, you know, I'm not done. You know, there's, there's things I can do to help, you know, lead, uh, and, and to have the character to do it. You know, that's the type of guy I'm, I'm convinced, you know, regardless of what I always on, you know, he, he would have done good. And I, 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 and that was, that was my, my message to him was, you know, it came out that he had said that, uh, yeah, you know, he was low jaded. He wasn't probably going to do it again. I was like, no, like you keep doing it. Like you lost your first one. So did I keep at it. And then something, something that was not secret at all. Of course you flew, uh, you did a Super Bowl flyover. Right. So after, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you're trying to, the regiment is also trying to get your guys promoted too. And so, you know, the promotion board looks at, your achievements regardless, you know, they, they see your records and they see your evaluations, but you know, they might not necessarily see company commander on your, on your OER or your ORB. And for the, the uninitiated, 
you know, won't understand the captain in the 160th is pretty much the equivalent or the platoon leader in the 160th is in large part the equivalent of the company commander in the regular army. Mm -hmm. And so they, they did it. They, they heavily uh, push as many non company commander complete uh, captains in the 160th out to the regular army to get the company commands, you know, to bring them back in so that they, they could get promoted to major. Cause that was, we were doing the downsizing in the late 2000s, uh, or, you know, we're talking 2012, 2014. So army is getting smaller. We're having retention boards and whatnot. So anyway, so went to the regular army, went to the 101st. And then this flyover thing comes down the pipeline. I've been a company commander for like two months. I'm like, and my, my, I remember my, my battalion commander calling me. He's like, Hey, so I got this coming down the, down the pipe. Like and we were, we were stressed. Like we, we were short manned. We had all these, uh, all these training missions we were lined up for that we had to complete. He's like, we got this task here. Like, you're going to tell me that you can do this, right? I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll figure that out. So, um, so they sent um, all they sent the airframes to New York, and you know, it was uh, it was fun. I mean, flying over the Super Bowl, uh, you know, be, being that, uh, and of course, it was that night as well, which was also advantageous because all of us, you know, the the unit had just come from being in Afghanistan. I'd spent all these hours flying in Afghanistan, and I came on. Um, and, uh, you know, they had the Hawks, the Apaches and the Chinooks, you know, in the back. Um, yeah, no, it was, that was, that was fun. So, so and, it, and it was, go ahead. No, Sorry. please. I, I go ahead, finish that. And then I'll ask you. Um, I was going to say it was in and of itself, you know, worthwhile because it gives you a chance to, you know, I worked with a different battalion commander that wanted to become the brigade commander, you know, seeing how he handled things and it gave you a chance to get away from the mothership. And kind of, all right. Well, I'm I'm in charge here. Like I got to figure some of this stuff out. Like you know, if we have a down aircraft, or we have maintenance, or uh, you know, just, just dealing with that stuff that you won't necessarily deal with when you're when you're at home station. Like you're on big board rules, and you got to you know, um, you know, ad adapt, uh, make it happen, or or you know, get fired. Hey, how, how many when you're doing that? Like how many conflicting interests are there? Like there's do you guys, there's whatever you know. There's the FBI, there are local police. Like, who who are you working for at that point in time? Uh, for the Super Bowl flyover, yeah. Or, um, yeah. I mean, we had we had uh, battalion or we had brigade level representation that was dealing with um, with local authorities. Uh, I guess the biggest deconfliction was airspace. And having you know that having a liais liaison with the FAA because we were flying low, um, and we had to have special permission. And really, I think the most uh, the restrictive part was also, I mean, there was that you know flying basically you know at the, at the level of you know the Super Bowl coming down low, but then also flying up and down the Hudson because you're talking about some very restrictive airspace rules. Mm -hmm. So you know. I didn't have any of those conversations, but those those conversations happened. They were pre-briefed. You know, we were told what our left and right limits were, and so that way the expectations are known. We have approval, uh, and then you know we just we just follow follow through. So, um, yeah, I don't I don't know if we had to deconflict with uh, with FBI or uh, you know what all federal agencies we had to. I know the FAA definitely got got involved. That way they. Um, you know, they, they knew not to throw any red flags up and scramble anything to Shoot come you guys intercept. Down. Yeah. Yeah. So are, are you guys the black helicopters that people complain about flying in, in, in U.S. cities that, that NATO so, is coming in to invade us? So it's funny you would mention that. <laughs> um, so I, I look at Drudge Report. That's kind of my news aggregator I go to. Uh just because it's it's got a decent mix of all sorts of stuff, and since 2016, I haven't seen really. Well, I mean, there's been a couple pop up, but I remember like uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the the exercise down in Texas that had everyone all flipped Shade out. Um, yes, that. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and I don't think the 160 even had anything involved with that, but there. Uh, I mean that that is so. There is a, a very dedicated effort to get 
you know, the flight lead program within the 160th is, is, is very important because you're talking about the, the progression, the training and the, um, the certification of a, of a, of a person that is expected to be able to take any mission anywhere in the world and get our most elite forces there plus or minus 30 seconds. And so that's, that's a very high bar to jump over. And so, you know, there, there is a, you know, um, there's authorities and there's a training program developed uh, to incorporate that into. And then, of course, that's mutually beneficial both for the ground force uh, and for the air assets. And so, um, but in, in short, yes, if you ever see black helicopters landing in downtown LA, uh, yeah, it's probably, you know, probably some friends of mine. It's not yeah. the UN. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's but, not like they can reproduce those situations on a military base and the the ruts the realistic urban training right yeah right and so they they have to you know take an abandoned building they have to take a space someplace where it's a realistic training environment correct right right and and really the only time that goes bad and when i say go bad i'm talking about in the media is, is when the local community isn't brought in and and uh, and that's that's not within the DOD's side. That's always the local officials that failed for for whatever reason to get the word out, and then people get freaked out. And once once you basically say, "Hey, this is what's going on, and this is why," they're like, "Oh, okay, I understand it." But if they don't, then you start getting those news reports that you know. And granted, it was it was really bad between, um, let's say, two thousand two to two thousand. I got wrong, years wrong. 08 to 16, where, where the news have come out with like, oh, we're conditioning the population for, you know, for uh, for martial law. And like, no, that's, that's, not, that's not what's happening. Like, this happens all the time. Like, we do on a quarterly basis. It just doesn't hit the news all the time. Right. Right. Yeah, I've heard some but, funny stories over the years about, you know, like so, the local populace tearing into the, the local mayor. And the next thing you know, some squadron commander has to appear in his class A's down in, down in small. Sometimes it's in like Smallsville, USA, not just big cities. Like, uh, yeah, well, this is kind of what happened, you know. Yeah. Uh, actually, on that note, uh, you also mentioned that uh, you flew uh, time-sensitive targets for the Ranger Regiment a few times. I was wondering if you could tell us what, what that experience was like. Yeah, so, I mean, completely different mission sets. So... Uh, you know, much more the, you know, we would go in, um, you know, me and the flight lead in the morning and, and really that happened more so when I went back there for my second flying rotation at the end of 2012. Uh, and we still did the, uh, the village stability operation stuff, but they, you know, we started collapsing our footprint more and more focus started going towards, you know, there's only so many assets, right? So, uh, so th that got picked up by us as well from the guys that I was with. Um, the, uh, and so we would go in, we'd get our, you know, the, uh, Intel would have their, you know, their list of potential targets and their, their, uh, their fidelity on different locations. And so we would get grids we'd get it, you know, basically a heads up that, Hey, we might be going to these locations. And then, you know, there was a cutoff point where we basically said, Hey, at this point, like we, we got to shit or get off the pot. Like we either got to, we have to have a grid and we have to, you know, develop this plan to make it by, this time or we don't and this isn't happening and then you know we had as much information pre-canned as possible so that you know all we needed was the grid and then we could basically you know we made it an efficient process and so that we could get out the door make the mission happen and you know then land and drop off the guys they do their mission you know we would go loiter somewhere and then come back and pick them up and um and carry on the next day. I remember you guys making a, us all each individually stand on the scale and weigh, weigh in full in full combat gear yeah. and weigh us. No, I mean that's like, but I mean that's that goes to show how exact your planning process is. Like you want to know the exact weight of every single soldier with water in their canteens before you take off. Yes, and especially in Afghanistan, and depending on the, the environment as well. I mean, there's there's. You, there are times of the year and, and altitudes that you have a little bit more margin for error. 
Uh, and because I remember in Iraq, like a lot of times we could we could take as much as we could throw in the bat. Uh, I mean, I never, you know, and there's seats out waivers. You know, it's a much more so like a seats out waiver. Like you, you know, you uh, if you don't have it, then everyone's going to be in a seat and bul- buckled up. And so in the I didn't even know they event, had seats in a in a forty seven. I didn't even know that was a thing. <laughs> Yeah. So what yeah, the, the fuck? He's not I've, been, I've been cheated. You, you've never flown luxury. <laughs> I was cheated. Yeah, there, there. I mean, sometimes there are. It's just like, another lie. Sometimes there are hostesses <laughs> bringing like drinks and snacks down the way pre-mission. Yeah, I I remember in Iraq when I was in tenth cab, like how much of a pain it was to get a seats out waiver for for a mission, and within the regiment, it was just kind of like a, that was. It was like a um, a pre-existing uh, established thing that was just kind of there, like it was it was done, like it was it was approved um, at all times. So, um, but yeah, I mean, weight's weight's important because that that that's the difference between getting off the ground or not, um, and or or getting off the ground and damaging a component of the aircraft that then you have multi-million dollar assets sitting sitting at the uh, at the at the flight line for a couple of days after you broke it. That could be doing missions. Can can you tell us a little bit of the challenges uh, between like Dealing Iraq and and Afghanistan? Because like Afghanistan, sometimes like a load would be ten dudes. Where like you you said in Iraq, it it you, as many people as you as many guys as you could fit on the on the aircraft. Yeah, I uh, I'm trying to remember if it was how crazy the number was in Iraq. I mean. Like 50, I, I like, say, like fifty dudes is not crazy, right? He, no, I, I want to say I want to say fifty five or sixty. Like, uh-huh. I mean, we're talking packed in there like sardines. Um, but yeah, Iraq. You know, during the summer, you know, we, we would have issues with weight, but we would usually we would usually cube out in Iraq. And once again, we're talking. Um, one of the difference is also between a, a a CH versus an MH. The MH. Uh, has a, a much larger fuel capacity. Just, uh, I think it's double, right? Yeah, 67, 6,700 pounds in a, uh, in a conventional and 30, 13,200 in an MH. So that was another thing we could we could work with within the, within the MH community is you could regulate how much fuel you had in. Now, granted, you also had to make sure you had enough on board to get you from point A to point B, but you didn't necessarily, and we hardly ever went out the went out the door with the ground force with a full tank of gas because if you did, and that's you know for every two hundred fifty pounds that you have in the fuel tanks, you don't need that's one less guy in the back if you don't have a target. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, weight planning was important in Iraq, but not nearly to the extent that it was you know in in Afghanistan because you're dealing with much uh, things surface elevation and the Kandahar was. What four or five thousand, you know, right from the start. Um, and I'm probably off. <laughs> it's been a little while since I remember. I mean, Iraq, like, you know, you're not at sea level, but you're not nearly talking, you know, thousands of feet uh, right from the start when you're taking off from the ground. And after, so after all the, the these uh, fun times flying around, you did a couple tours as the Siege of J3, 2015 and 2016. Yeah. So uh, when I when I finished my company command and I went back to the 160th, uh, I, I filled a, a deputy operations officer role at the uh, 06 level command that was in charge of all air in Afghanistan. Uh, and so they had, you know, it, it was a joint command. So you had mostly Air Force, but then a handful of night stalkers working in there, uh, both to be subject, subject matter experts within the, the air component. I mean, really, that was it. Like we, they, they wanted someone there that understand understood our mission set and weren't just, you know, AC one thirty or MC one thirty pilots. It was truly a joint command that we could all, you know, share information and work with, which was great for me, not just the unit, because then I got to actually work with AC one thirty pilots and MC one thirty pilots and get to understand their mission set and their limitations and how they looked at, you know, what I did as a rotor ring pilot, but but through their eyes as well. And then also understand more of the ISR component and then, you know, what the special operations weathermen did. I mean, it was truly, you know, just, I mean, it was every aspect of soft air in a room. And I just, 
I learned so much. It was great. And it gave me a chance to step back and kind of see the overall picture of what was happening. And that just, you know, much more of a tunnel vision and tactical sense. Um, and it was, it was great from a professional development standpoint. So special operations weathermen are guys who do like a four man stack on a, on an incoming cold front. <laughs> Something like that. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I remember first hearing about them, you know, seeing those AFN commercials sitting in Iraq. Uh, I mean, like, oh, really? You guys need a, you need a, uh, an Sun, ad piece for that? Sun okay, that's right. Up. AFN, Armed Forces Network, for those of you who didn't have the privilege of watching oh, TV my God. in oh, Iraq. Jesus. Yeah. It's like being yeah, one of those were... dystopian, futuristic movies where, like, they're playing propaganda everywhere you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, so that was we for real had a special ops weather guy in the in the siege of Soak doc, uh, but, who, who had time you know with an ODA out in the field doing weather reports you know for the you know for hire. But no, no, like know. like like sarcasm aside, Joel, like what does a special ops weather guy do? Like we've never had one on the show before. We've never really spoken about it, and I know they're the butt of many jokes. But like, in and reality, if anybody knows one, we'll have one on the show. Yeah, no, great. for real, we, we I'd be happy to. Talk about like, for, Chinese for, weather for real though. Like, what, what do those guys wins. do? I so I, I can't speak on how important they are now in the much more digitally interconnected, you know all weather, you know, uh, you know, data capable world we live in and trying to string words together to make them sound, <laughs> uh, sound right. Uh, but definitely in, you know, in previous years where you, if you rolled into a country, like, uh, I mean, that was the guy that was on the ground that could actually make a forecast, you know, make a, a determination based off of, you know, wind speed, temperature, uh, you know, pressure altitude and, and, and uh, um, and dew point if if it's going to rain or if it's going to be foggy or you know what do, like can we actually get helicopters here or not? I mean, so for you know for, for an air component, it's 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 important. Um, you know, much less I guess important for somebody that's kicking in a door and uh, you know isn't so worried about the weather, but the pilot coming in or out of there is. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's what they, they had systems and they had technology that could that could look at the current weather conditions and, and forecast what it was going to look like in the next 12, 24 hours and kind of speculating here, but, um, yeah. Um, then the next assignment was, uh, if you could tell us about how you got assigned to fifth group and what that job was. So I, uh, at the end of my, my last time with the one sixtieth, um, you know, I, I, Kind of saw. I started getting the inclinations that I wanted to get out, uh, and it was it was time to kind of hang up. Like I, um, both from a, a personal standpoint, but professional. Like it was, you know, get out while the while the going's good, and you know, because I was, you know, you get promoted up and as. And that's another thing that's great about being a warrant officer. And that's, you, you know, fly, if I wanted to, you can fly forever. You can fly forever as an officer. You're going to get promoted out of the cockpit in one way or another, sooner or later, and. I had enough time on staff that, you know, if I don't like what I'm doing, I hate life and I don't do good at my job. <laughs> so yeah, I was like, eh, maybe it's time. And then from a personal standpoint, looking at where I was in my life and my family and, you know, you know, we, when you have a family business and the older generation is kind of, you know, he, he's there, but you don't know how many more years he's going to be around. And then we're talking about my grandpa. Um, you know, it was like, you know, no one's getting younger. Like I should probably get home and figure out this, this other thing before, you know, before it's too late. And, um, so anyway, so I got, uh, I got picked up for command general staff college and, you know, the chance to get a master's in a year, you know, basically full time active duty with the obligation that I'd, I'd served two more years. So I, uh, I went out to Fort Leavenworth. I did, uh, you know, did that. Uh, I was seeking an assignment as close to home as I could, um, you know, for my kids. And, you know, while I was there, I also, you know, I, I met my met my wife. And, um, you know, that's a whole other, you know, it's, it's a pretty cool love story. She's still in the service. She's a, she's a Missouri National Guard cool. woman. Um, and, uh, but, uh, and so I, I was seeking a, a place. I actually tried to get assigned for or the Scott Air Force Base because, 
that might not be well known, but there's two four star commands here. You have the Air Force Air Air, uh, or Air Mobility Command. So anytime you hop on the C seventeen, that's AMC. That's where aircraft. that's where General Minahan is. He's blow, blowing us all up with those memos. Uh, I, I guess. Um, you don't know about. I, I wasn't tracking the, the name. Yeah, no, he, he, he's sending out memos saying how we're going to be at war with China in a year or two. <laughs> like, I got I to I gotta go Google that one. Now. You Thanks Google that. that. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's it's a uh, it's a lively memo. But anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. Sweet. Well, if he's got kids in the school district, uh... <laughs> <laughs> there's another connection there. Um, so they got AMC, but then they also have Transcom. So Transcom is the overall four-star strategic command over all, you know, it's, it's the strategic transportation command. And they have an army component there called SDDC. And so I, I actually got a by-name request to go on the uh, uh, SDDC uh, staff uh, from the two-star general there. But, uh, you know, aviation branch was like, um, I'm sorry, buddy, like you're you're an aviation officer. We just sent you to command zero staff college. Like you're not going to go work for the, you know, for a transportation <laughs> command for for a couple of years. Right. Next, what's next? <laughs> so I was like, well, I, I like Fort Campbell. I've been there. Like being with Fifth Group would be cool. Um, oh, by the way, I knew where they were, and I really wanted to. I really kind of wanted to get to Syria. I figured if there was a place, you know, to to finish my career off, to not only be impactful, but also for my own professional development and, and understanding because. You know, I was a political science major. I mastered in security studies, like international relations and, 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 you know, what we're doing in the world is important to me. And that was definitely a place where a, a lot was going on. A lot, a lot of things kind of hinged on what was happening there. We had the fight with ISIS. We're, we're, we're allying with the Kurds. You know, we spoke earlier. I think if you want to have an understanding of, of a true history and what's gone right and wrong in the Middle East, you just study the Kurds. I mean, they've been, they've been, They've been worked both sides by different superpowers, you know, for for generations. Um, you know, what's happening in the region is, is definitely important from a from a special operations background in, or, or standpoint. Just trying to understand, you know, how it works. I mean, Syria that's that's where you would want to study because, for the most part, from a doctrinal standpoint, you know, special operations is something that is. is in large part, kind of a supporting effort to the conventional force. Like it's this thing happening, but the, the main fight is the conventional. It was a completely different operation in Syria. Like Syria was a soft mission being supported by conventional. Um, I mean, and so the soft was the main effort. That's not normal. Mm -hmm. And so, from an academic standpoint, but also operate like it was like I, I want to go there. I want to, and, and I had the opportunity, so I wanted to deploy in there for four months uh, in, in twenty. Oh, 17. Yeah. So, um, yeah, feel free to. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 No, I, I have, I'm fascinated by Syria and, and the conflict there. And I, uh, I, I could pick your brain for hours about that, but I'll try to hit the, hit the kind of the wave tops on it. Um, what, what was your role when you hit the ground there? What was the job? So there, uh, so I went to the fifth group and I, I put in for that and I was accepted. And I, went, uh, I went there as the group aviation officer. Uh, so it's a, it's an 04 billet at the, at the group level. And then you have 03s at the battalion level. Uh, and the other thing that was cool too, there was, you know, I'm a former 160th officer. I got friends in the regiment. I think one thing that's great about fifth group and really made my, 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 my real job really easy is uh, they have an established relationship with both the 101st Aviation Brigade and the 160th. So getting air support to fifth group was not hard. Like, you know, the, it, it was, you know, I had an NCO that had a, did an amazing job that you know, pretty much did everything that the group aviation officer or other groups would have to do. Um, which unfortunately made me more of a an event manager and a you know, fifteen six investigation officer, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> so, so I uh, I got to Syria because I needed a fire support officer to work a twelve hour shift because one of the battalions didn't have you know they had a actually they didn't have an O or an NCO, so you had a warrant officer sit in the day shift and they had me sit in the night shift. And uh, at first, I was just doing reports because most most of the uh, most of the fires missions and the approval was down at the uh, at the SOTUS level, not at the um, actually sorry, no, I was at the SOTUS level. It was at the uh, the ODA level, um, 
And, uh, and so, you know, I was basically just looking at what they did and, you know, reporting it to hire, you know, in large part just for, uh, you know, record keeping, you know, that way, uh, you know, we took track of where, where things were landing and what, you know, that way if something were to come back and there was collateral damage or there was an investigation, like we had a record of what aircraft, what time, what munition, um, you know, from a, from that standpoint. Uh, and then we got backfilled, uh, with actual fires guys. Cause, you know, as a Chinook guy, like I, didn't, I didn't have a lot of experience dropping bombs or, or shooting things. So my guys in the back did, uh, but not, not so much me up front, but, and so they, because Syria was such a hot topic, uh, issue, um, we had so many stars rolling through as, as VIPs. It became, it, it basically gave me the job of being the VIP management, um, uh, officer. So every time, you know, Votel or one of the staff members or Funk, which is cool because my, my, my entire life I had been, I had heard about this general Funk that was out there. And like, oh, you're related to him, right? Like, no, like, I, you know, and probably distantly back back in Germany because Funk is the equivalent of Smith in German. But uh, so I, I finally actually got to meet Funk in Syria when I was uh, um, in, under his charge because Funk had the overall mission both in Iraq and in Syria at the time. Um, so whenever Funk or Votel or any other star or high GS level employee would roll into town, I, I would help coordinate you know, who was meeting them, where they're going, um, all of that fun stuff. But then also being integrated with, you know, what was going on at the time with both at the strategic level and, and our level with, you know, if Turkey was invading a certain area of Syria, the Kurds would then all of a sudden, you know, stop fighting ISIS because they were trying to go help their buddies that were getting shot at by the Turks. Like it was... Yeah, a lot going on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Q, I mean, since you had this sort of like big picture view of what was going on in Syria at that time, can you kind of like lay on us like what what was going on on the ground in Syria with the Special Operations Task Force? What was it, uh, I think it was called was it called the EFT at the time, the Expeditionary um uh, uh I'm trying yeah, e to, I'm, e e e ETF stands for Expeditionary Task Force. So I I and my role had nothing to do with that. You still got me? Yeah, we yeah. got you. I can hear you. Okay, sweet. My seven-year-old is trying to FaceTime me. Oh, uh, I'm still trying to FaceTime me. No, nah, it's, it's all good. Um, anyway, I'm going to keep talking. Am I breaking up at all, or is it coming through uh, all right? the, the screen is moving, but we can hear you okay. Okay, so, um, so he basically had... You know, in large part, just like you have anywhere where you have an operation going on, you, you're going to have uh, uh, – where I was at was much more the the, con the conventional fight, but with soft forces. So the, you know, the fight that we were supporting with the ODAs was with the Kurds. We had the, uh, the SDF, the Syrian uh, – Defense uh, Force. Syrian, yeah, Defense Force. Or, or, Kurds. or Syrian um, Democratic Forces. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, okay, you're right, second time. Um, so we were basically fighting a conventional fight, you know, with a, a terrorist organization that had ground. And so we were, you know, fighting against them, pushing them back, taking back, you know, no shit, you know, geographical terrain in a, in a conventional fight. I remember being in the talk one day when they were joking about, you know, like all these SF guys have absolutely, like, we're actually doing, um, oh, crap, what's the, what's the terminology for it? Um, uh frame, uh, symbology, um, you know, drawing stuff on maps, right? Like actually doing like defensive positions. Oh, and, like doing map uh, overlays? Uh, no, there's a better term for that. Um, arts and gra or arts and or graphics. Um, yeah, you, I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, basically, <laughs> basically yeah, doing, doing overlay being like, Hey, we're, we're, we're putting up, we're setting up defensive fighting positions and we're doing mm -hmm. tank, you know, ditches and, you know, all that stuff. And so the SF guys are like, we don't, we don't do this. Like, like we're having to like kind of go back to the book and look in that doctor to see what these lines mean. Um, uh, and so that's, that's what, then that's what I was involved with. But parallel to that, there was the CT mission going on 
um, of taking, you know, our, our elite guys in and, and kicking them doors and, and, uh, and, and taking uh, high value targets back to, you know, back to de- detain them. Um, so that, that was going on. That I occasionally saw a mission brief just for deconfliction purposes, like, hey, we're going to be here um, just for your essay. Like, okay, cool. Um, and what what state, I mean, while you were there, I mean, how did you guys perceive the, the conflict is going? I, I mean, and, and what was what was even the goal when you were over there? So at that point, um, I think ISIS... I don't think ISIS was out of Mosul yet. Um, we called it the MERV, uh, the Middle Euphrates River Valley. So this was after, um, is it Raqqa? Is that the right? Raqqa the was city? Yeah, the ISIS capital. The, the capital. So Raqqa had fell. Um, and so I think ISIS was down to maybe a third of the terrain that they at their peak had had. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they were still... They're so dangerous. Um, really, for us, our we spent I felt just as much time trying to figure out what the Russians and the Syrians and the Turks were doing as we were what ISIS was doing. Like it, it was seriously like I mean it was you know we were worried you know you know there, there were pot shots going between the Turkish and the Syrian border and you know the SDF was worried there and. And Erdo, Erdogan was, you know, pushing into enclaves that were primarily Kurdish. Um, but so for the ISIS standpoint, I mean, and, and I guess what I'm trying to get to is it was it was all of that because our primary focus was the defeat of ISIS. Like that, that was our mission. That was why we were there. Um, but there were other, you know, geopolitical actors at play that were that were preventing that because every time. Erdogan would be like, hey, we're going to go take, that, take care of these Kurds and we would lose our fighting force or, or inability. And that's why in large part, like, we actually had to go into a defensive position and a pause because, you know, a large part of the Kurdish force is like, hey, we don't have the manpower right now. We got this other problem to take care of. Like, eh, it'll be all right. And we'll come back. <laughs> uh, like, well, shit, like, what else are we going to do? Like, our fighting force is saying we're not going to go in the offense right now. And so I got to see that, like, we were making ground, and we stopped, and then we paused, and then, and, and then right before I left, we started going into the offensive again. Um, and, I, and I think by the time, you know, I actually left the group to go back home, like, I think ISIS pretty much was gone at that point. I mean, granted, the, their capabilities were, were all up. You know, I mean, they, 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 didn't, they no longer posed the, the threat that they did at the height of their their power, but we were also seeing the transition where they were, they were starting to go underground right, and they were right. starting to be like, like, you know, going back into the shadows and doing what AQI did, you know, 10 years. I mean, cause that's what ISIS, you know, was born from. Mm-hmm. So and, they were just reverting back to their own, their old ways. And then you were there for the whole shit show at Derazor. Um, I think so. Um, Remind me. I, I remember the. I remember the name, but I when when it when it was announced that we were when it was kind of abruptly announced we were going to pull out of uh, Syria, and then it was like, well, no, we're going to stick around and keep the oil fields, and then the Bradleys came in, and no, that was after I left. Okay. I was there when uh, Red Line got crossed and Tomahawks got dropped on. All oh, right, um, right. Assad, Assad mm-hmm. locations. And then I was I, I showed up a couple months after we had wasted away about four hundred Russian mercenaries. Yeah, the Wagner guys. Um, yeah, so that was that was. I mean, I wasn't there for that. I got to see some of the video after the fact and had a conversation with the guys that got to see it. And and you know, I and it was, I didn't the, the officer, the overall uh, uh, you know former SMU general that was in charge of that. You know, I remember hearing the story. They didn't talk to him about it. I definitely met him. Um, about how he was, he was basically just kind of like looking at his screen and going, all right, kill that, kill that, kill that. Because <laughs> we were – apparently, like, everything was in the air. Everything was ready. And the moment they launched munitions in the wrong – right, you know, just close enough in the direction of some of our guys that, you know, that was the trigger and all hell broke loose and they just got – you well, it, cor- cor- correct me if I'm wrong, Joel, but didn't we, we actually did use like the red line phone with the Russians and asked them like, Hey, are these your boys? And they're like, not, not us. We're like, oh, okay. 
That, that's the story I heard. And then it was just mayhem after that. Yeah, well, and actually, when I was there, they did try. It, it looked like they tried to do the little green men, you know, little uh, little green men approach as well. And then we deterred that with a bomb. Um, like trying to infiltrate, inf- infiltrate, you know, front your your lines with irregulars. Yeah. Yeah. Some people um, never learn, man. Well, I mean, Putin has his objectives, and, and we definitely see what's what's happening in Ukraine now. I mean, this isn't, you know, like I mentioned earlier before the call. Like I've been binging, you know, a lot of uh, frontline lady lately, and kind of rehashing, you know, the, the 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 narrative of Putin from when he came into power until now, and you know, it, it's it's. You know, the threat is there, regardless if we're talking about Georgia or we're talking about Chechnya or we're talking yeah, right. about, you know, Syria or now Ukraine. Like, the same approach has been happening. He's just pushing it a little bit further right. little bit until he finally gets, because he hasn't been stopped yet. Right, yeah. right. It, it's sort of the same way. Yeah, Russia is still a democracy. I'm just always the president forever. Of course. Right. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if you have any recollections, I mean, that, that was um, early on in the pretty early on in the, the Trump administration where, you know, we fired uh, it, it was res- well, it was re- in response to a chemical weapons attack. Right. And we fired uh, mm-hmm. Tomahawk missiles on some of the uh, regime targets. Uh, what was that like from your standpoint being in Syria? Um, it was concerning. Right. I mean, because you get the heads up. <laughs> That it yeah. was going to happen. Um, I remember there were some jokes about gas masks and freaking out the the battalion command or the uh, I mean battalion. He was just you know the soda commander about the XO walking in with the gas mask and you know just freaking him out like, hey sir, <laughs> like get, get, are you ready? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I remember taking a, you know, I, I was trying to be careful, right? Like, I, I, I didn't let many people know where I was going or where I was. Um, but I remember the, the day, the next day, like, you know, I woke up and uh, there was a praying mantis on the on the steps outside my, my little chew. And I took a picture of it and I was like, hey, man, we're, we're still here. <laughs> uh, it was just kind of cool. You know, I, you don't see many of those ever. And then, you know, here he is like hanging out in my, you know, my front porch in Syria. Um, but yeah, it was, we were watching it, you know, we saw the, you know, we knew what was happening before it happened. We, we watched the, the speech on TV and I, it appeared that we deconflicted as best we can. Like we, we told the Russians what was going to happen. You know, and if you look, take a look, when you look at the, the open source information that's available now, like the Russians moved all their stuff, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, out of the way. Um, but yeah, so uh, but yeah, the uh, the movement, the giving uh, Kurdish ground to Turks that happened after I left. Mm-hmm. Um, I was there though when we 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 were preparing because we were moving. We were trying to prepare for phase three to phase four. And, and for those that aren't aware. You know, you got five phases of operations within the military, and phase three is like kinetic. Like you're, that's the moment where you're killing each other, you're shooting each other, you're destroying each other's forces. But then after the shooting war stops, you get into you know, more stability operations and trying to reestablish you know, public services. And so we were, you know, trying to do our due diligence and trying to prepare for what was going to come after ISIS was gone. And so I was, I was there when we had that you know, weeks of preparatory information and putting briefs together when um, when it went to the, you know, the president's desk. And then the next day it was announced that he made a comment about, about leaving. And that was unexpected because that wasn't part of, you know, obviously we weren't leaving yet because the mission wasn't complete. ISIS still had ground and it was still very much not just a, a terrorist threat, but a, a no shit like military you know, thread that had terrain, it had ground, it had, um, you know, it, it, anyway, so, you know, it, that, that definitely was a, a seismic shift, you know, even in the, in the defect, you know, we, we had it and call it a defect, you know, cause we, our, our local, you know, our food was locally pr- pr- 
provided or made by, by local um, Syrian Kurds. And, you know, we had those conversations, just, I had that conversation with one of the chefs. He was worried. Like, like these guys are, are working with us. You know, they were worried just like, you know, South Vietnamese were when, you know, the North Vietnamese rolled in. Like, what's going to happen to them if we just pull out? Right, right. And that was up and up and up and down the chain. You know, not just in the, the kitchen, but you know, the guys that were trying to fight ISIS. Like, like, like we're working with you. Like, we can't do this if you guys leave. Yeah. Um, needless to say, that, that kind of got um, smoothed out, and we continue to work with them. And you know, as far as I know, we're, I don't know to what extent we still have, you know, troops in, on the ground now in support of them, but, you know. So Kurds are strong people. After that deployment, you decided to retire from the military or, or, or get out of the military. And um, I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about your transition process and where you are. Do we have any questions for Joel? About we have a we couple do? of comments. Let me get those real quick. A couple of comments, questions. Um, so let me just. So, Joel, why, why don't you just uh, hit us up with, uh, you know, kind of like what uh, what that transition was like for you? So, I, um, for me, I, I I did my best to plan for it. I mean, I've definitely heard all the stories of how difficult it can be, and and in large part, it's you know, it's still ongoing. Like, you know, trying to find that that post army job that, that works. Like, cause you, you know, I'm not flying. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I, I, I did have a plan of always getting into agriculture. Um, but then, you know, you have a certain set of skills and experience and understanding, but also you haven't been home for, you know, however many years have been gone. So, um, you, you try to fill that gap and, you know, you're all also dealing with physical constraints. So, for me, the, the best thing I did was I came across a program through the train, uh, uh, career skills program. So I was able to sign up and get my, my group commander to sign off on allowing me to come home on an internship. So I interned on a local farm that was doing pasture raised regenerative agriculture. So I was, you know, I was still getting, you know, I was still in the army dime. So I had all the benefits uh, of, of working for a farmer, learning his skills and his trade so I could apply that, you know, to what I wanted to do. Um, and so that was beneficial. Um, but yeah, I mean, it hasn't, hasn't been easy. I'm still, I'm still working on it, still figuring it out. I mean, I got out in the uh, summer of, uh, of 19, and, you know, it's 23 now, right? So that's what, four years? Mm -hmm. It's a process. Um, yeah. Um, it is, but you know, it's, it's it's good to be back and to be able to, you know, have that experience, have that, that wider aperture to bring back home. Um, I don't know if I actually answered the question or not. Yeah. So, uh, what so yeah, I, I I interned, I did the farming thing. I'm still working on the farm. Um, yeah, you know, and, and and that's of course a gradual process because it's, you know, anyone will tell you when you start a business, you know, at least what I've heard, you're talking. You know, at least five years so you're really profitable so you know I, I'm, I'm working on my taxes now and we're projected you know right now you know i guess the sole source of farm income is is, is selling eggs which i wasn't planning on having a, a giant you know egg shortage across the country and um i haven't raised my prices even though everyone else has uh, i've raised prices earlier this year due to inflation you know pressures but um you know, we're expected to have about twenty five thousand dollars worth of sales. You know, this year of eggs, you know, well, five hundred birds. We we talked about this before the show, though. All you have to do is raise corn and get those sweet government subsidies subsidies for that high fructose corn syrup. Right, right. Um, I'm trying to take it a different direction, and <laughs> uh, so. You know, and, and there's there's a lot to be said, and for those that are interested in it, there's plenty of, to be, you know, to watch or read about it. But, you know, if, if you look over the course of the last 50, 60 years, you know, agriculture has gone the way of, of many other industries. There's more automation, there's more there's more centralization, uh, there's, you know, you've lost margin to scale. So, you know, if you want to be um, a wholesale 
farmer, you know, you're, you're, you're raising corn, you're raising soy, you're raising wheat, and then you, you harvest it and you take it to the, to the market, um, you know, your margins are pretty thin. So you have to, to be able to make any money off of it, you got to get thousands of acres, and we don't have that. We got a couple hundred. And so for me, as I'm looking across the spectrum, and, and that's, you know, another reason why I went into the military. You know, my, my parents didn't encourage me to go into farming. They saw how much work it was and how much it, it doesn't necessarily pay off. Um, but I, I think it can and it will if you take it a different direction. It's, you have to use a different business, business model and you have to use, um, you know, be a little bit more, uh, be more innovative and go away from the wholesale concept to a retail concept and, and work with customers and establish a marketplace. Um, it's It's more... It's definitely more intensive and you're, you're operating basically as a CEO, CFO, um, and your own marketing agency. Um, but that for me, and granted, I'm still in the process of making it happen. I'm by no means a, you know, a resigning success story yet, but you have to increase, you know, your revenue per acre and you have to add value to whatever you're selling. Um, Got uh, questions for Joel? Yeah. So first off, uh, thank you very much from Jungle Jim Scott, uh, two Citadel bros, CIA vet uh, Basil Baz, a former guest on our show, and I, Jungle Jim Scott, send our congrats for your heroic 160th service. Jack is going to interview my friend James uh, Files, the CIA mercenary who shot JFK soon. Jack has had my cell number. Call me later. Go dogs. <laughs> awesome. And, uh, did, he say what co- did he say what company he was in? He did not. That. No. Oh, yeah. And uh, for uh, for him, I was a I was a battery uh, battery boy. So I was Palmetto battery. We got we had to fire the cannons at parade. <laughs> nice. What are the different companies there? Uh, I, I probably I, they've added more since we've left, but everything's alphabetical. Yeah, uh, you got A through A, and Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, all the way to like Tango, and I think they added a, a Quebec and a. Um, and they probably have an extra at this point. Damn quick you know, Canadians they're... are everywhere these days. Um, <laughs> and Joe's got you. Thank you very much. Does 160 have any role in advising and training other countries' special operations national aviation units? Good question. Like, are there exchange programs where you go over to learn or teach this level of aviation? You know, I, I completely forgot. I kind of brought, glossed over that. So a Super Bowl was cool. You know, flying with Obama was cool, but my my favorite training mission ever was going to Columbia, South America, and and that's exactly what we did. And so, yes, the, we do. Now, granted, they don't have nearly as advanced, you know, they don't have the you know nearly the budget we do. Uh, but to kind of recap that mission, we were the first, as far as I know, and that's what we were saying at the time. Uh, organic helicopter unit that, that self-deployed from Savannah, Georgia to Columbia, South America. Uh, so we flew from Savannah to Florida, then to the Dominican Republic. We helicopter air-to-air refuel en route uh, to there. And then Dom Rep, I actually, um, depending on who you ask, I either broke the helicopter or the helicopter just happened to have a stress fracture in the, in the, in the blade because of my really shitty job of hooking up to the, uh, the MC-130. Um <laughs> Hey, hung out there for a couple of days, and then we went to Columbia, South America. In Columbia, we did um, training at two locations. Um, they're, they have a base in Cartagena, which is based kind of like their Fort Benning, mm-hmm. and their uh, um, their Fort Rucker shoved together. So they have aviation and they have infantry. And so some of the some of the pictures that I sent um, over showed that. So we were doing we were doing jumps, we were doing over mountain, and really one of the scariest flights I ever had. And I'm, you know, didn't think I was going to die, but you know, it was one of those ass pokery moments. Was trying to fly over the Andes at night in between cloud layers. We actually flew. We went, we flew back because you know we had, one of the aircraft exceeded a, an air temp um, or an engine temp um, limit because we were we were pulling so much power to try to get up get over the mountains at night. Of course. Um, so yeah, so we were everywhere we were going in Columbia. We had a, a Colombian aircraft working with us. Um, and then we were we were doing stuff with their ground forces, and then when we went to um, up near uh, no, Cartagena is on the on the coast, Telemida. So Cartagena is where we did the the ground the the water stuff. We worked with their equivalent of like seals. 
So, yeah, that was that was great. That was fun. That was a fun trip. And then this is actually just a comment that somebody pointed out that uh, Alan Mack let Funk know I say hello and wish him well. Alan's scheduled on the show. NSDQ. You have his book. NSDQ yeah. forever. Awesome. Thank you, Al. I was going to plug your book at the end of this because I don't have one. So uh, um, I'm glad you're going to be on the show. Um, so Al never flew with him. I would have loved to have. Um, he was the SP when I went through Green Um and so that that man, yeah, that's an national treasure. He's he's got a lot more cool stories than me. <laughs> and and is NSDQ Night Stalkers Don't Quit? Right on. There you go. So Joel, I mean, you made a uh, you made a run for Congress. Do you have any other political ambitions? Uh, dare I ask uh, that we I'd get into that territory on this podcast? But I mean, what what are the plans for the future? I do. Um, I'm 39, right? So I'm I'm young, you know. You, I've so I ran for Congress. Uh, I lost in the primary. Um, I'm going to keep this as nonpartisan as possible. Thank um, you. You know, but I, I lost the primary by a couple hundred votes out of fifty thousand. So that's that's a pretty good pretty good number. Um, but I'm a you know I'm a product of gerrymandering, right? So there's no point in me running for Congress for the next ten years because the district I'm in is the bottom third of the state. It's got like thirty five just thirty five counties in it. And if anyone, I mean, you can you can pull up the maps and look at it, but you know, the guy that's there is going to be there till he dies or retires, um, and and it's not much better at the state level. And you know, I ran for county board this last cycle, and same thing. Like the you know they've the, the lines are drawn, so if you got a particular letter next to your name, you're pretty much you know up you know ninety five percent. You're going to either when it just because the letter next to your name because of the way that the, the lines are drawn. Um, so yes, uh, I will run. I will continue to run. Um, I'm on the school board for a couple more years until I'm up for that reelection. Uh, but I mean, we, we need good people in office. We need people that are devoted to service, um, that, that aren't just, you know, sh- screaming and yelling and, mm-hmm. you know, just trying to, be in office is to be in office and actually make stuff happen. Um, you know, our, I, I don't think anyone in this list and this will agree that our politics is not broken and dysfunctional. And then um, that has some very deep root causes, which is you know the two party system, the winner take all. Um, and we need election reform. So in, until you know, I'm, I'm a believer of, uh, of markets and the marketplace, um, and the marketplace to me means more than just, uh, you know, the stock market. You know, I, I have I have interest in finance. I'm working in finance now as well, in addition to the farming. But marketplace to me is uh, is ideas and it's people, and you know, the more diversity you have, uh, the the more fair it is. You know, the the best product wins, the best idea, the best candidate, uh, as opposed to just you know, the party that, you know, the monopoly mm-hmm. that happens to be in place. And so things like ranked choice voting, uh, you know, will, I think, advance that. I think, you know, we haven't had it. You know, another thing is increasing the number of congressmen or congresspersons that we have uh, in D.C. We, we capped that in the 1900s. And so, you know, what that allows for is a more stratification of, of our population, rural, mm-hmm. urban, um, and so the more we're divided, you know, and I don't want to be hyperbolic about it, but, you know, if, if you look at places that have fallen apart, whether it be Afghanistan or Libya, I mean, you, you see where a breakdown in civic discourse and in governance um, will then transpire into, you know, eventually, you know, violence um, where, you know, w- you know one demographic Usually, you know, not necessarily always ge- geographically, but often geographically, it was like they're disenfranchised. Um, and then, if politics doesn't work, pol- politics is you know the way where we take legitimate grievances and we hash them out and we try to make bargains and make things as fair. And if people don't feel like their grievances are being heard and you know things are getting better, then then government is no longer legitimate. And, right. 
for further and, escalates. And, and that goes that goes for all sides and all segments of the population, right? Right. Joel, where uh, where can people find you if they're looking for you? If they want to subscribe to the Joel Funk newsletter, you know, Joel, Joel for Congress, or, or, or move to your district and, and elect you, <laughs> or, buy, or buy your uh, eggs. Right. So um, I'm not marketing eggs uh, outside the local area thus far. So um, I mean, you can uh, you know really you know I, I still hold a political page on uh, on Facebook. You know, it's, it's Joel Funk as opposed to Joel D. Funk, which is my personal. And then we have the Funk Family Farm um, Facebook page. Uh, but you know, I, I would say, you know, really, you know, focus on finding local, local farmers, local producers, you know, buy local, you know, get to know your farmer. Um, you know, once again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a firm believer in the marketplace. So, you know, use... Don't just vote. Use your money and vote. So if you don't like the way things are, and you don't like the fact that you know, you know, local producers and small small businesses and small family farmers aren't making it anymore, you know, buy from them. Get to know them. You know, don't just buy everything on Amazon and you know, buy your buy your vegetables at or your eggs at at Walmart. You know, use your vote with your dollars and you know, and the ballot. Right. Like people can complain about a company like Monsanto, uh, Monsanto or whatever, but if they're not going to their local markets, if they're not going to like their, the, the farmer's markets, like you can complain about it all day long, but if you're still giving these companies, these organizations, your money, it doesn't matter what you complain about. Right. Yeah. Just get to know them, elevate the, the voices that are out there trying to make a difference like Joe Salatin, um, you know, and, and, and others within the regenerative agriculture movement. Um, yeah, or, you know, I'll give him a plug. My friend, Charlie Jordan, you know, near Fort Campbell, you know, Al, Al knows him, knows him very well. He's, a uh, he's, he's getting into flower or he's, he's been into flowers for a couple of years now. He, you know, great guy. He's the guy that gave me a, you know, like I mentioned earlier, he, he gave me my check right. Um, uh, leaving the BMQ or leaving the, um, office of Greenberton. So, Guys, uh, this coming Monday, we're going to have another show. We're going to have Chad Collins on the show. A little bit different. He's an actor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he, is the, he is the star of the Sniper franchise. He has taken the reins from Tom Berenger and is the star of Jack the, is going to fanboy out. And he, is also, uh, he also plays a character in the Call of Duty video games. Uh, so he's going to be on on Monday, and then on Friday, uh, Tim Weiner is coming back on the show nice. for a second appearance. Uh, we'll be talking more about contemporary stuff with the, uh, uh, about the intelligence community. So that'll be Friday. Um, Joel, thank you so much for coming on the show, spending a few hours of your Friday night with us. Man, thank you is, so much, Joel. Yeah, this has been a really good one. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me and, and, and let me tell my story. And um, it was great to get to, you know, to connect with you. I mean, I, uh, I guess one, one, one last thing or two last things I sure. say that a take, a takeaway is, um, you know, regardless, you know, just kind of back on that transition conversation, like, you know, you, you don't lose until you quit. Right. So, you know, every time you hit a, you hit a hurdle, you get a stumble, you know, that's it, just a process towards where you're going. You're, you're not a loser until you quit. And it's, that's why nice offers don't quit. Um, and also, um, oh shit! I just, I just, it just left me. What was, what, what were you there's saying? There's another, right there's another that? take, there's another takeaway. Uh, crap. Um, I can't remember. Something about your transition. <laughs> uh, if you want to tell us, we'll post it everywhere. Uh, if you remember, just like message us. Right. Or we can sit, we can just sit around and everybody be quiet for like the next five minutes and, I mean, and, that would work. <laughs> and if it comes up. <laughs> um, well, what, what were you just saying? Uh, we, we were talking about Joe. Uh, talking. We talk about Joe. We talk about Jack fanboying out. Uh, we talk about politics. Uh, Tim Weiner coming on the show. Tim Weiner. We talk about eggs. And, and local farming, Monsanto. Uh, God damn. 
I can't remember. It was uh, yeah, not Quentin and um, yeah, whatever. And, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm, su- I'm supposed to be the one who's drunk on this show. It's okay. Uh, all right, guys, we will see you on Monday and then again on Friday. Joel, thank you so much. Yeah, we thanks, deeply man. appreciate it, man. Uh, thanks, you guys. Take all care. Right. Take care.